Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise today on behalf of the Australian Greens to join my parliamentary colleagues in celebrating the life and contribution to our nation of Edward Gough Whitlam, who died last week aged 98. What a life! 1916 to 1916 until last week. In that lifetime, born during the First World War, served with the RAAF in World War II, served 26 years in the House of Representatives and became our 21st Prime Minister, married for almost 70 years to Margaret, who he described as the love of his life. He was a towering figure in the life of the nation for all of us born after the end of the Second World War. In 1972, I was at the Tasmanian University as a 19-year-old. I wasn't able to vote in that election because 21 was still the voting age at that time. But I had known nothing in my entire life except Liberal Country Party government. It's an extraordinary thing to think about what it would mean to a young person to have got to the age of 19 and known nothing other than one political perspective. For 23 years, from 1949, the Liberal Country Party had governed this country. And that is why the Whitlam years politicised a generation. Those three years changed us. At that time, we were still a nation which followed. We followed the United Kingdom. We followed the United States into the war in Vietnam. We still had capital punishment for federal crimes. What Gough Whitlam did was throw off all the shackles and allow us to rethink who we were as a nation. What did we love about our country? What was our place in the world? What did we want for people? And what he did was set us all on a path of exploring what it is to be truly Australian, independent, confident and distinctively Australian in the cultural context. As a 19-year-old at that time, the two issues that were central to our thinking, one was the call-up. When you're a young person and your friends and families are standing around a radio or a television and waiting for the lottery where the birth dates came out on those balls out of that machine and people standing around knowing that that meant that they were destined for national service or conscientious objection and imprisonment. That's what it actually meant, even though most of the troops had been brought home from Vietnam by that time. We still had people serving in Vietnam as advisers and we still had national service. That was something that everyone in that 72 election was thinking about at that time. The other thing as a young person, I came from the country, from northwest Tasmania, and to get to university as a young woman in 1971, my first year at university, there's no way my family could have afforded to get me to university unless I got a scholarship or found some other mechanism of getting there and I chose a teacher studentship because a teacher studentship paid more than a Commonwealth scholarship, which I did get, but I had to go on a studentship because it meant that that was less of a burden on my family to take a teacher studentship. So I can tell you in the 72 election, what we were thinking about was ending the call-up, was getting to the point of free universities because we knew what it meant 
for people of all backgrounds to be able to get to university. And so, in that election result, in the two weeks following, when so much happened so quickly, it was transformative for our whole generation. And in terms of what was achieved, I talked about a sense of who we are as a nation, and I thank Senator Faulkner for a wonderful contribution uh, outlining the achievements of the Whitlam years. But I want to refer to some of them in the context uh, of, of what I'm saying. And one was, of course, on nationhood. The fact that we ended the um, God Save the Queen as the national anthem and we got Advance Australia Fair. We got our own Australian honours list. We had the change in terms of the Queen of Australia. We had a commitment there to the notion that Australia was an independent country and one day could become a republic. It set an inspiration in the minds of all of us that this is what we as a nation could do. The recognition of the People's Republic of China meant a redefinition of who we were as a nation in terms of where we looked and where we thought of ourselves. It was a recognition of where we sit in the world, not only geographically but geopolitically. The idea that the Commonwealth had a role to play in the nation, whether it was education, whether it was health care, whether it was urban development. And one of the things that we can look back and recognise is that the decision by the Whitlam government for the Commonwealth to enter health and education and urban development changed Australian cities. And the urban development engagement led to the reconstruction in many parts of Australian cities that we can look back to today as the legacy of those years. Our cities are better for it. And of course, universal health care with Medibank ending university fees and, of course, a recognition of needs-based funding uh, in our schools. They were incredible achievements. But also on Aboriginal land rights. Uh, Senator Faulkner has spoke about uh, the, the putting into the hand of Vincent Lingiari the sand in Wave Hill Station uh, as being one of those incredibly important moments. Uh, in the history of the nation and the move to recognise land rights, to move on that, and also hand in hand with a recognition that we had to do something about racial discrimination more broadly in Australia when it came to Aboriginal people, but globally. And remember that this was 1972, the year after the Springbok tours, and again, I was at university at that time, and there were protests from one end of the country to the other about the fact that we had uh, racially discriminating sports teams touring our country at that time. People wanted to make a stand, and the Whitlam government did, and banned that from occurring. I want to talk about the environment for a moment, because this too was important. We had the Bielke Peterson government in Queensland at that time prepared to drill for oil on the Great Barrier Reef, and they intended to do it. And imagine what would have happened looking back today if they had been successful in doing so. But they were not because the Whitlam government took them on. Ultimately, the Great Barrier Reef became a marine park. In terms of other uh, achievements, the ratification of the World Heritage Convention, the National Parks and Wildlife Act, the Environmental Protection Impact of Proposals Act, for the first time the Commonwealth taking a role in overseeing the environmental impact of major projects as they were proposed. But not only that, the Whitlam government went on to negotiate several treaties. Ramsar, the protection of wetlands around the world, was a major contribution of that period. But also the treaties on protection in migratory, for migratory birds, particularly with Japan. We had the International Trade in Endangered Species uh, uh, Treaty also negotiated and the Whitlam government taking a predominantly important role in that and, of course, setting up the, Heritage, the Australian Heritage Commission. 
All of those things have had profound ramifications for the nation in years since. But saying that the Commonwealth had a role on the environment, actually ratifying the World Heritage Convention meant that in later years the Hawke government, uh, as a result of the major community ca campaign, could support and protect the Franklin River in Tasmania. All of these things had their seeds uh, during this time. On the arts, uh, I think uh, there is no doubt that the contribution of the Whitlam years uh, is highly significant. As Gough Whitlam himself said, in any civilised community, the arts and associated uh, entities must occupy a central place. Senator Faulkner mentioned the letting of the contract to build the National Gallery, and as people go into the National Gallery, it's not only the construction of the National Gallery, but he supported a collection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island art being a predominant part of the collection. But I remember Pollock's Blue Poles very well—$1.1 $1 million on one painting. And I remember the conversation around the kitchen table on the, in the farm in northwest Tasmania, and my father, for the life of him, could not understand how you could possibly spend $1.1 million on a painting and that painting. And so uh, we had this conversation around the table, and of course it wasn't uh, until I was researching uh, Gough's life and contribution for this speech, and it fits entirely with uh, Senator Faulkner's analysis, uh, that um, Gough Whitlam would never take a backward step when he had approved the $1.1 million to purchase Pollock's Blue Poles. He made sure that it was the image on his 1973 Christmas card, <laughs> uh, which just demonstrates his commitment to it. But in, apart from the National Gallery, he also legislated for minimum uh, Australian content for radio stations in Australia to give a boost to local and Australian talent and this cultural identity and, of course, his establishing of the Australian Film Commission leading to films uh, such as Picnic at Hanging Rock and Gallipoli and others that were made uh, as a result of that. In terms of family law, there is no doubt that the no-fault divorce made a huge difference to the, to the uh, social cohesion and life of the nation. That was a major contribution uh, to the way that people thought about what their possibilities were, what their, what their capacity to change things were. That change to the divorce laws were, was highly uh, significant uh, for many of us. In terms of uh, the life after his political career, it is entirely appropriate that he was made ambassador to UNESCO, especially since he had made such a contribution to establishing environmental law and Australia's role as part of global treaties protecting the environment. And so that ambassadorship to UNESCO was important, and of course his companion of the Order of Australia, uh, so well obviously deserved. Chairman of the National Gallery, well, for someone who'd let the contract for the gallery, I'm sure he felt that as an enormous achievement and something he could do, successfully do, but also he was part of the successful Sydney Olympic bid. Uh, and that work that he went just always looking to the future of the country and then of course his profound commitment to Australia as a republic and the role that he played in the 1999 uh, referendum. So I wanted just to conclude by saying to his family, to his four children, his five grandchildren and his great grandchildren that he made an enormous contribution to the nation for which we are grateful. But we send our love and condolences to you at this time of grief, but hope also that you can take comfort in the outpouring of the respect, the gratitude and the love that so many Australians have for a man who shaped our nation, for the courage and commitment that he demonstrated his entire life in whatever he did and the fact that he gave Australia the confidence to break with the past and set out 
on a journey towards a progressive, independent future in which all people are equal. That is a great contribution to our nation.